evening, everybody that's joining us out there in the internet wonderland. Uh, I'm Ben Bogey. I'm a builder in Connecticut. Uh, this evening, I'm drinking uh, Can't Block the Light from uh, Cantina Brewing, uh, brewed by the brother of one of our project managers. So uh, tonight's topic is a building science Christmas carol, spirits of building science past, present, and yet to come. BS and Beer is an independent grassroots movement to share building science knowledge through local meetup groups and this, our Zoom show. The brew crew and our guests volunteer our time each month to bring you what we hope is a fun and informative discussion. We encourage you to start your own local group. For information on how to get started, visit the bsandbeershow.com and check out our December 2022 show on that topic. Find the chat box icon at the bottom of your screen, post questions and comments there. Be sure to click all panelists and attendees or everyone, otherwise Zoom tends to revert to panelists only and we're often too busy to respond to your comments. The video recording of tonight's show will be available at Green Building Advisor and all past shows can be found there and also on YouTube through a link at thebsandbeershow.com. And an extra special thank you to our media partners, Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building for putting up with our shenanigans continuously and making this thing happen for us. And with that, over to Mike for announcements. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Mike Maines, designer in Maine. Uh, I am drinking a Bigelow, Brown, Bigelow Brewing Brown Ale. Fortunately, I'm not stuttering on bees tonight. Uh, it's a nice, nice uh, cold winter evening sort of beer. Uh, a few announcements. Uh, Taunton's Sustainable Home Building Accelerator, also known as Emily's Pretty Good House Training Course, is still open for enrollment. Uh, with a significant 40% discount. I'll put a link in the chat. Uh, our Pretty Good House book is also on sale at a big discount. Uh, so get that, pick that up for Christmas. I'll put a link to that in. Um, our newest, <laughs> nice Travis. Um, uh, our, our newest uh, local BS and Beer group, BS and Beer Rhode Island is now live. Their first meeting will be on December 13th at Whalers Brewery in Wakefield. Um, I'll put a, chat, a link to that in the chat. So if you're in Rhode Island and you've been waiting, now is your chance. Uh, last but not least, uh, NAHB's International Building Show in Las Vegas is February 27th to 29th. Uh, a lot of the BS and Beer organizers will be there. Uh, Travis and Ben are running the construction performance zone and putting a lot of work into that. And I'm going for the first time, so I'm excited to see everybody and I hope to see you there. Um, just to tease a few upcoming shows, uh, January 4th, we have Fire Safety with Sharon Halpert. Uh, February 1st, we have Multiple Chemical Sensitivity and Environmental Sensitivity with Corinne Segura. Um, on March 7th, we'll be participating in the Passive House Accelerator's worldwide uh, event featuring high-performance projects. And April 4th, we'll talk with, Tim, with some folks from Timber HP here in Maine about their brand new uh, line of uh, wood fiber insulation. That's it for announcements. Emily, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Hi, I'm Emily Mosh. I'm an architect here in Maine. Um, in honor, uh, I'm drinking out of my Energy New Brunswick uh, water bottle. I'm teaching a continuing education class after this tonight, so I can't have beer. Or I don't know what I'll say. Uh, and uh, I have the honor tonight of introducing Joe. If you guys don't know who uh, Dr. Joe Stiebrick is, um, I'm not sure why you're on the BS and Beer Show. Um, he really needs no introduction, but we'll start with uh, founding principal of Building Science Corporation. Uh, his work ranges widely from providing expert witness testimony to overseeing research and development projects to writing for ASHRAE Journal and BuildingScience.com. There's so much more in here. Joe, tell us something that people don't know about you. I think that is more appropriate for December. <laughs> I uh, was a ski patroller for 25 years because I couldn't afford to ski any other way. And um, I uh, used to play football very badly. And I used to ride motorcycles um, very uh, badly. And I used to be a home builder very badly. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to paint out that failure has made me the man that I am today. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great introduction to the show tonight. Uh, Travis, uh, introduce yourself and then we'll let Joe take it off from here. Yeah, thanks, Emily. I appreciate uh, I appreciate the intro. 
Yeah, I'm Travis Brungard. I'm ordinarily in Prairie Village, Kansas, but today I have the pleasure of being in Denver, Colorado, uh, but also not skiing, uh, doing other things badly in the tradition of uh, my betters. So I am drinking uh, a Great Divide Colette, which is a delicious farmhouse ale uh, here brewed locally. So uh, I don't think anyone came to hear me talk about me or my beer. Let's get on to Dr. Joe. Well, I want you to know that I'm, I'm drinking an Italian beer. It's uh, made in Super Tuscan. Not Super Tuscan. Oh. So um, I know some of you have heard this story before, but um, here's, what's, here's what's going on. Um, we're building stuff really badly, <laughs> even though we're not wanting to. And um, we've got uh, failures up to yin yang wazoo. And those are metric terms. Uh, a yin yang is two wazoos. And what, what's, what's happening is, is that uh, because we've changed energy flow and materials, um, we can't build the way that we used to. And this being America, we're not being proactive, we're being reactive. And, um, you know, it's like things become intolerably bad and then we change. And it's, it's unfortunate that's, that's not the way that we, we, we should be doing things. Um, I mean, we're, we're, we're catching on. It's just that we're not catching on as quickly as, as, I, as I think we should. My, my favorite uh, person to describe America was Winston Churchill. And he said that Americans can always be counted upon to do the right thing after all of the alternatives have been exhausted. And we're slowly working our way through um, exhausting, exhausting the alternatives. And it's not that we um, don't want to do the right thing. Uh, we're, we're trying. It's just that if you can't do math or physics, go into politics or become an activist. And, and uh, I'm, I'm already irritating people, but I, I want to share with you um, three or four things because I view it as a, a giant Christmas present. Um, what's happening is, is I view all of the failures as a giant Christmas gift that will allow us to um, celebrate uh, the failure and move on to great and spectacular, wonderful things. I, the future is insanely bright, but we have to go through the stupid phase because that's who we are. And by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm an American, okay? I, 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 I grew up in Canada, so I'm polite and I know how to drive, but I now am, am here and, and uh, uh, love the country. And, and oh, by the way, um, I was always destined to be an American. My dad was a fighter pilot during the Second World War. And when he, uh, in, in, in Eastern Europe, and when he uh, joined the American army in, uh, uh, after the communists took over the Czech Republic. He um, spent two years in the American army in Germany and then got approved to immigrate to the United States. The problem was is that on the boat across the Atlantic, he got so seasick when the boat kept throwing up and the boat docked in Halifax, Canada, he got off. And so the reason I ended up becoming American is <laughs> Canadians because dad threw up in Halifax, I just took another, you know, 40 years to complete the journey. So our family eventually did make it into the United States. It just took an extra couple of decades. Um, what I'd love to do is, is uh, if you, I'd like to show you a few images and then open it up and you all can beat me up and tell stories that may or may not be true. But what, what do I need to do? Click share screen. Yep. All right. So let's see if I, I know how to do this. Um, energy flow. We uh, dramatically reduced the energy flow. This is in Cleveland. And what happened was is that that's, that was me when I was younger. Um, we, uh, yeah, I, I used to look that way. I know it's hard to believe. But um, we insulated thousands of houses in, in, in Cleveland with, with cellulose and also fiberglass, and all of the paint fell off. 
the buildings. And the reason that the paint fell off the buildings is because we reduced the energy flow. Walls had always been getting wet from the outside by, by capillarity at the overlaps. And um, we got wicked between the laps and all of this always dried because of the energy. And well, when we stopped the energy flow, we still got wet, but um, we no longer had energy available to dry. And what happened was is that the wood moved more and the paint blistered and failed. So we had massive paint failures, not because the paint was bad, but because we changed the energy flow. And, and that was sort of an aha point that um, still doesn't resonate with, with people. We're, we're insulating up the wazoo and we're gonna to have to continue to do that. But people understand that there are, there are consequences. There, there's, 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 there's more. We gave, it the, we gave the building wedgies and, and, and turned the problem around. But well, attic venting, let me tell you more. Um, attic venting only works in poorly insulated attics. See, for moisture to be removed from an attic, um, the air coming in it was too cold to pick up moisture. So we needed poor low levels of insulation. So that the heat from the house would cause the air that was coming in to be able to pick up moisture and, 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 and carry it out. But when we have extremely well insulated the attics, we didn't stop the moisture from coming in. And what happened was is that when we ventilated, the ventilation air was unable to remove the moisture. And so we basically, this is my own house way back when, I was stupid. I insulated the attic and, you know, went, you know, well, what happened? Well, the moisture from the inside, you know, accumulated on the cold surfaces. Why were the surfaces cold? Well, because we insulated. How come the attic venting didn't work? Well, because the air that came in stayed cold because we had insulation. You know, the one to 300 ratio, which was a wonderful ratio, was based on poorly insulated attics in the 1950s. And so then what did we do? Well, we air sealed the, the attic ceiling so that, you know, the moisture from the unit houses didn't come in and that solved the moisture problem in the attic. But what did we do? We created mold and moisture inside the house because we reduced the air change. And if we really did a good job, we spilled and back after the products were combustion. We got carbon monoxide poisoning. We began, began to kill people. And, you know, that's not particularly very good. So, you save energy and you rot the building and you kill people. Well, yeah, that's, you know, let's, let's export. So this is in Canada. So we exported this technology to the United States to get even for the Wayne Gretzky trade, but that's, you know, <laughs> another, another trade. then what did we do? Well, because we, we don't understand the second law and you know, we put vapor barriers in the wrong freaking place. So, you know, let's, let's air condition our buildings and put vinyl wallpaper on the inside. We, we call this, we call this a hotel. Um, Mold doesn't have an internal digestive system. And so when the mold accumulates on the back of the, the vinyl, it exudes a digestive enzyme. So it basically pukes on the back of the vinyl. The enzyme reacts with the plasticizers in the vinyl. We get pink and yellow and orange spots. So I named it the Marriott measles, the Radisson rash, and the Hyatt hives. Just thought it, I don't get hired by those folks anymore. Then, you know, we discovered truss uplift because, you know, the bottom cords of the truss were now cold or now warm because we insulated and the top cords were, were cold. And so top cords grew, the bottom cord shrunk and, you know, everything popped up. And, well, gee, why, why do we have drywall cracking? Well, you insulated your freaking attic. All right. You know, great. Then, then what did we do? Well, you know, everything failed with stucco because we glued stuff to it without drainage. And of course, we pioneered it with hotels and then exported it to housing and thousands upon thousands upon thousands rotted, but we wanted to save energy. Well, let's, let's glue foam to the outside and not figure out how to drain the wall. And you know, what's nice, the foam made it nice and warm. So it rotted really fast, right? I mean, this is, yeah, well, you know, this is great. You know, and this is, you know, the, the owners want Everybody know that that son of a bitch Eddie built this house. So you know, don't don't buy don't buy from Eddie. Um, that's Eddie. But um, then you know, OSB. I mean, look at that. That's the that's the spam of wood. Um, spam is the OSB of of luncheon meats, right? And 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 you know what what happens is is that 
you know, plywood used to read when it gets wet and OSB doesn't. And when you have OSB behind stucco in a well insulated wall, uh, the city rots. And, uh, you know, Vancouver, the Vancouver condo crisis happened because we went to two by six construction and went to OSB and, 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 and it was the end of the freaking world. Um, and the only thing that made went Vancouver happy is that they exported the technology to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is now rotting away. And, and you know, um, yeah, this is, and let's make it even worse with lumpy stucco. And, and, and you know, <laughs> this is interesting. Lumpy stucco, nice. All right, so let me um, now go back to being a, a panelist with you and, and say, um, as we begin to double and triple the level of thermal resistance, as people say we want to have higher interior humidity for, more, for better indoor air quality, I mean, if you listen to the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta and the Harvard School of Public Health, you want, you know, the optimal relative humidity is going to be, it's going to be supposed to be 35 to 40 percent. Our buildings can't take it. And, and, they sh and the existing building stock sure as hell can't take it. So then we're going to insulate probably incorrectly and add the humidity. And the only people that are going to be happy are the fire people because the buildings are going to be too wet to burn. All right. <laughs> That's our Christmas present. Now, if, if we unwrap the Christmas present and we take it apart and look at it piece by piece and be a little proactive, we can end up building the most durable, the most comfortable buildings on the planet. And then we could share this technology with everybody else. But we're going through an insane, miserable, you know, Dickens version of Christmas that, you know, the, the, the Christmas Carol night, nightmare that will turn into a positive thing as we're beginning to fix all of this. So please don't hate me for being a downer kind of a person. I'm a very positive person. It's just, I've been doing this a long time and I've never seen things this bad, but I also feel that I'm never going to see I'm, the things that are going to be so freaking good at coming out of it are, 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 are extraordinary. It's just that we're going through this, this phase. And the problem is, is, most people don't want to talk about it. And so you now you, you're, you're, we're being censored. We're not allowed to actually communicate. Grandfell Towers, you know, 80 people died. And nobody knows out here that it was a, a deep energy retrofit that failed because they put insulation in the wrong place with a ventilated cladding that was stupid and it popped out of an energy efficient appliance on the second floor. How many people know that it was bad energy conservation that led to a massive fire that caused 80 people to die? Oh, no, that's politically not freaking correct. Oh, you know, let's put in a humidifier because we want to make our air quality better. Well, I view humidifiers as, as ISIS bioweapons, the aerosolized stuff that are going to make people sick. I mean, well, you're, you're just so negative. No. I don't want people to get sick. I don't want them to die. I don't want a building to die. I don't want it to be sick. Okay. That's kind of the message is we're going through this phase. All right. I'm done. You all have to do therapy with me now. I'm going to cross the line and, 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 and say that it was meant to shock you and irritate you, but I want to get us on the road to, you know, fixing this damn thing. So. There you go. Got to crawl before you run. Actually, so, you got to fall before you crawl. <laughs> I'm killing us. I, I hope we're at crawling and not at falling. I hope we've fallen once and maybe we're headed towards crawling. We we have a, a handful of questions that have come in. Um, here's just a, a, a softball for you. So uh, from Alex Schoendorf, he says, my question for the group is how to tackle my foundation finishers from punching stakes in the poly before placing the concrete. Um, why do you need to punch stakes in the poly? Generally, we see them doing it as a way to set their elevations for when they're placing. 
So they'll put a, a wooden stake or a metal stake, which they'll then, you know, hit with the transit and put their elevations on so that as they place the concrete, they're placed into elevation. Well, let me, let me tell you that the, the, the puncture is irrelevant to the vapor transmission of the slab. Um, vapor diffusion is a function, direct function of surface area. You've got a thousand square foot slab of concrete. You could walk on that poly with, you know, basically golfing shoes for an hour and you're going to have less than 5% holes. Who gives a shit? So the concrete is the air barrier. Just ask Jimmy Hoffa about how airtight concrete is and then not care about the, the small punctures in the, in the poly. You know, don't worry about it. It's just, that's not your, that's not your problem. I don't, not an issue. Well, here's one. Uh, D David Gerstel asks, uh, I, I'm puzzled why the work Joe in Pretty Good House addresses is declared to be science when the work structural people do is termed engineering. <laughs> well, because um, engineers don't have a personality and we don't know how to market. So I'm just telling you, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm married to an architect and she's saying, what's wrong with you? You, you, need, you need a life and nobody understands. What's wrong with engineers? I said, well, thank God that I'm you know, a mechanical engineer and not a structural engineer. They're really boring. Okay, just letting you know. I don't know. How many scientists do you know that are not also somewhat boring as well? All right. I, I, I know of I know a few scientists and um, um, they're actually quite funny, but just in a weird way, right? You, you know, I like you know, on some kind of, you know, you need to listen to Mark Bomberg explain the second law of thermodynamics with a Polish accent when he's in a good mood. And you're like, where did that come from? And, and so anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Or I, I have a question. Um, 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 are va variable permeance membranes the answer to most of these problems, or or are they hype? All right. Do they work? Yes. Are they an interesting technology? Yes. Um, are they necessary? No. If you aren't colossally stupid, you don't need them. Now, if you are colossally stupid, half of the time they will save your sorry ass. So I, I don't have any issues with um, recommending them. Um, they don't hurt you. And if you've done stupid things, they can help you. But you don't need them if you don't do stupid stupid things now the next the current new generation of these membranes is, is quite quite insanely clever where they're directional and they the the direction of flow uh, is not the, is different and so they let things in this way but not in the other way and and that in itself is 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 I'm not going to mention product names, but you get the idea. That's that's they're Swiss, but that's um, whoever thought that the Swiss would freaking you know know anything besides you know um, um, fondue. But anyway, um, I'm going to get into trouble with that. But so there that there, there's some pretty impressive technology, but the impressive technology doesn't compensate for stupid ideas. So we have a, another one here. Uh, first off, thanking you for all of your contributions to building science. Uh, you're the reason why this person began learning in the field. Um, the question is, is they'd like to hear your opinion on the use of moisture sensitive insulations applied as continuous exterior insulation, e.g. paraffin treated rigid wood fiber board. Uh, some of them are marketing these as being able to be used as water resistant drainage layers for both roof and wall assemblies. Do you feel that's risky? Well, yes and no. And that's a perfect consultant answer. Don't you love that? 
It depends. It depends. <laughs> oh, that's even better. <laughs> All right. If you have a back ventilated and drained cladding, and if you are back ventilating and draining your insulation, uh, but not back ventilating enough to trash the thermal resistance, they're going to do just fine. If you don't do that, um, they're not going to work. So um, you, there are ways of using them, and there are ways of not using them. And so um, I, I believe they, they have a significant future. Um, I, I'm not sure whether you know this, but we used to build out of real wood, <laughs> and it, it, it burns. It, it, it's, uh, it rots. It molds. It has different properties based on the orientation. If somebody invented wood today, it would never be approved as a building material, right? If you think about this, and we figured out how to how to how to how to, how to work it, um, we used to build with asphalt impregnated fiberboard back in the back in the day, and uh, you know what we now have is basically a a high tech steroid version of fiberboard. We we call it the Roger Clemens effect, you see, because of the steroids. Okay, that is very funny if you're, okay, never, never mind. I, the, the point is, is that, uh, yeah, that like most things, um, uh, every, I call it uh, Clint Eastwood thermodynamics and insulation. Every insulation has to know its limitations. Remember Dirty Hair, every man has to know its limitations. Every insulation needs to know its limitations and you, you adjust for it. And I, 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 I don't have any issues. I, I just think that they need to be used a little differently. And I, in, as, as I'm starting off with these newer products, I'm going to be ultra conservative. I'm not as conservative with the older products anymore because I know their limits. With the newer stuff, we don't know their limits. And so you want to be extra conservative and, and you know, we might end up, well, you're, you're not going to need the, the hybrid moisture redistribution on the back of this insulating sheathing with, you know, a little bit of ventilation that was completely unnecessary. Well, you know, we know now after 20 years, but you know, I, I just want to, you know, until I want to be ultra conservative now because I'm, you know, I'm not going to, well, I might be, I hope to be around in 20 years because it's going to take 20 more years before my Maple Leafs win the freaking Stanley Cup. But, you know, there you go. Uh, to that question, Andy, I can share just a little anecdotal from my experience. I was uh, very concerned about that approach and had a project that we did about three years ago where the Europeans swore up and down that we could do that. I bit my tongue and we did a, a ventilated assembly. Uh, with the wood fiber insulation with no WRB over it. And after building it, I think it's feasible as long as you're doing things like having good overhangs and you're not challenging the assemblies. Uh, I left a chunk of that stuff laying on the construction site in the mud for a year. And about the only thing that happened is the like top 16th inch layer of it abraded a little bit. So it's pretty resistant, but. Well, I, I, I spoke slowly and used small words with one of the man, product manufacturers and said, why don't you put a little bit of stuff on the outside and think of it this way. You'll be able to print your advertising marketing on it as well. Come on, we, 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 can, we can do this. And the marketing people liked it in the, I said, it's a joke. It's just, you're not doing it for marketing it. You're, you're doing it for additional robustness and oh, by the way, you get to tell everybody, you know. But the bean counter is like the marketing part of it. So that's how you pay for the machine. I, yeah, I'm, I'm trying with these folks. I, I, hey, look, an engineer providing marketing and, and building it and, and, and financial advice, that's, that's just unheard of and out of my league. And I'm having fun because I am not the guy. <laughs> 
I think uh, you can make it durability too. I'm I'm pro. Let's print a QR code on it so that they know how to install it. Right? Who doesn't have a smartphone on here? And uh, isn't it Steve Basic that always says no bad products, just bad installations? So if we tell them also how to install it, maybe the the manufacturers would be happy because they wouldn't be getting called back because everybody is installing it wrong. Well, so. you know, I, I I love that. I'm gonna, Emily. I'm going to steal that eye. That that code. But maybe you can do something with it. I don't think there's enough Emily to go around to make it worthwhile. But I. I oh no no no! Know. That is that is awesome and woo 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 woo. This is this is really this is really good. Now they're also um, I, I love Steve Vazak. They're also stupid products, right? I so, agree. <laughs> I, so, I mean, I I just don't argue with Steve because he's like you know like. You know he was a marine, right? You don't know the marine stories? Okay, man Mountain. Yeah, I, don't, I, I work for somebody calls him Man Mountain, which is a. Well, I, 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 uh, I'm not going to share this here, but if we're in a bar, I'll tell you Vazak stories because he's going to tell Steve. He's stories. on the call, by the way, just so you know. He is well. Okay, <laughs> Steve, I'm shutting up, and you can't talk about me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. man. He's the reason we had to move out of our house in, 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 in downtown Boston because our office was in the basement. He was so tall he couldn't stand up without bending his head. And so he was going to leave us if we didn't have an office where he could actually stand up straight. Okay, just that part is true, but there's other stories. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here, here's one. Under what circumstances would you install an HRV instead of an ERV? Never. Okay, all right, that's a horrible answer. Let me let me explain. Um, HRVs are a great idea when we weren't overventilating. And I thought I'd never live to hear, I'd never live to say that you would actually need an ERV in a cold climate. Well, what is happening is, is that people are so intent on having high ventilation rates in cold climates, we actually need an ERV so we're not dumping a lot too much moisture on the outside because we want to reduce humidification because it's not a healthy way of doing things. I mean, uh, you know, the Mayo Clinic, who I respect the hell of, says if you're going to humidify, you have to use distilled water. You have to clear the. You have to clean the, heat, the 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 humidifier every two days. I see that all the time, right? You're not getting the humor there, and so because we have such a high ventilation rate desire in cold climates, the ERV is better in a cold climate than an HRV because I'm retaining the moisture. In the south, there's no way I can make things work without an ERV never be able to do, uh, never be able to handle the moisture. Now, it's so bad in the South that um, I also need a dehumidifier. You know, there's no air conditioning system on the planet that's available to be able to efficiently cool and dehumid dehumidify because we've, we've so significantly reduced the energy gain. And so we're, you know, one of the reasons that I'm a famous guy is that I was the first person to point out that an air conditioner is a dehumidifier, but it only dehumidifies when it's running. Oh my God, that that's that's why I'm 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 I'm, I'm the guy. But what have we done to the runtime of the of the air conditioner? Well, we you know we've got spectacular windows, we've got spectacular lighting, we've got spectacular. Um, appliances we've got insane levels of thermal resistance there's we've reduced the energy gain by more than a half and and that's just with regular buildings you ought to see the energy efficient ones and so i need something to dehumidify that's called a dehumidifier now is it possible to uh, improve the dehumidification capability of, of air conditioner stances well yeah we've done it commercially we just need to add an extra coil the problem is, is nobody's gone around to doing this yet. And so that's because people haven't figured out that there's a market, but there's a huge market. I mean, 
look at uh, look at Dex Thermistor and, and 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 Nikki Kruger. I mean, I mean, she's a babe. I mean, you know, Miss Miss Dehumidifier. I mean, I, that's spectacular. I I um, I would have never predicted it, and so here we are. You need dehumidifiers and you need ERVs. And wow, wow, wow. You know, 82, 83, when I thought I knew stuff, no. I, in a gazillion years, I would have never figured that we were here, where we're at now. And then the air conditioner manufacturers are playing the efficiency game by making the coils warmer so that even when they are running, they're removing less moisture. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, we, we, we had all this, we, we had all these issues with schools and when we the chiller temperatures, we, we raised the chilled water temperatures, and then we had modulating coils in, in the classrooms. And we created mold and mildew nightmare, but we saved an awful lot of energy. And so then we ended up having to, then we invented DOS, direct out to air systems, and we injected air conditioner, air conditioned dry air into this space. Uh, to compensate for the fact that we screwed it up by raising chill, chill or chilled water temperatures and went from uh, two position um, switches to modulating. And it's like, come on, there were people that predicted this, but you know, you've got the mob, so you've got the cult, and so the cult makes this pronouncement, and the cult implements, and then we have to fix it. And I, I'm we could, have, we could have prevented a lot of this, but on the other hand, we couldn't have because nobody would believe you until you did it. So in other words, we have to break it in order to fix it. And that's the Christmas message. The Christmas message is we're break, breaking things, but that's actually a good thing because then we fix it. And Americans are among the best people to fix stuff that is broken. And, and you know, I'm... I'm proud, but we're going through not a happy moment at this moment. Yeah, and a builder, a builder told me once, there's never enough money to do it right the first time, but there's always enough money to fix it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yep. <laughs> no. I think we do it would... nice because we do it twice. Well, I think <laughs> you're, you're channeling my dad, okay? He's, he's, he's passed away many years, but he, that was, he, I've become him. I, I I can't believe that you know what a weird guy he was, and then and now I'm I'm him. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> oh man, it's Steve Basic says, "Love you, Joe. Happy holidays to you, Betsy, and all Building Science Corp." <laughs> well, thank you very much. And you could use the word "Merry Christmas." I wouldn't be offended. Just <laughs> Well, the chat box is going crazy. I don't know how any of us are keeping up with what's what's going yeah. on in there. I'm, I'm posting questions on the on the on the list, but it's uh, or there there's a lot of them. Um, or, or one I want to uh, talk about or would like to or talk about is spray foam. Just I feel like that's a little bit of an elephant in the room, like in the green building world or green building. Some people love spray foam. Some people hate it. You know, or, or embodied carbon people like me hate it, but then we also see, but then some of us also see the use for it. Um, I know you're a fan because it works well. What do you see as drawbacks, advantages? Are the things that, that other things could do? Are we being stupid to even worry about the environmental impact? Was well, no, no, no. But <clears throat> wouldn't it be neat if you reduce the carbon footprint of the spray foams themselves? Sure. I, uh, can't tell you very much right now, but I think you'll be quite impressed shortly with some folks, companies that are coming out with magic stuff that um, <laughs> even, you get the idea. Yes. <laughs> okay, these, these big firms are not, are not stupid. I mean, some of them are okay, but they're not. And this carbon thing isn't going away. All right. And so you, you think with a gazillion PhDs and material scientists, you can't figure out a way to have 
something that's very similar to the existing foam products have an insanely low carbon footprint. You, you think that's not possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, de, de engineering the Coca Cola formula is more difficult than to make a better foam. All right, just letting you know. Well, that's good to know. Or one thing we're I did. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have more trouble with with concrete than they are with foam, right? So, okay. I'm just you know you <laughs> the foam challenge is not as difficult as the concrete challenge. Just right. With with apologies to the Romans and the Greeks and the Sumerians. Okay, just letting you know. Somebody just written down their recipes. We might be in a better situation than we are now. I'm sorry, the, the, the Roman recipes. If somebody had actually thought to keep grandma's little three and a half by five uh, Roman recipe card with the concrete mix on it, that would have been great. Well, uh, it's actually uh, well understood, except if you're an MIT uh, researcher. But um, you see, what happened was, is that what made it magic was the the volcano did all of the cooking. So uh, what was the pose alone from the freaking volcano? And so that was the magic part. And so when, when people say, well, you know, the Romans needed to add this or that, the answer is, well, no, they, the, you know, the volcano <laughs> did a really freaking good job. Well, why don't we use volcanoes? Don't look at me like I'm from a different planet. I'm, you know, from freaking Boston, all right, which is more or less like a, a different planet. And and so, you know, this, the energy that the Earth already has um, is also available to us. And just everybody take a volume and relax. There's going to be some really interesting thing in the next, well, in the next 10 to 15 years, you'll be thrilled i think i hope to live that long because it's going to take another 15 years for my maple leaves to make the goddamn playoffs 1967 all right 1967. So, i'm keeping up with your math here it's going to be 15 years for them to do the playoffs and then 20 for them to to win oh so my you're God. they're going to be in the playoffs for five years i'm going to be a thousand years old all right just letting you know methuselah stebrick <sighs> they're going to have to Never mind. Just next question. <laughs> <laughs> or Russ Chapman asks, um, have you calculated the future energy loads of your daughter's house with the addition of the three kiddos? <laughs> That's a lot of showers. <laughs> well, um, believe it or not, um, I I get a little bugged when people say there are too many people on the planet and the best way to uh, become green and save the planet is to have fewer children and fewer kids. And um, I'm not of that bent. And I'm, I, I think that uh, we should have more kids and we should teach them and get them to do better stuff. Right now we're failing our kids and teaching them and there are i mean i the educational system is in my view horrible i get into trouble i'm going to get you'll probably never invite me back when i say we don't teach the kids much of anything except how to feel good about themselves while they're unable to function in the modern world and i had to learn math physics i had to be able to you know deal with equations and geometry and, and, and calculus and, and all in junior high school. And now we have people that can't even write a sentence and get the grammar right. But man, they sure feel good and are able to protest, you know, because I mean, I'm just, come on, let's, let's teach them stuff so they can save the planet, right? That's how I would phrase it. Educate them teach them, let them be insanely creative, and they're going to save our sorry asses, I think. You know, I got triplets coming. God, well, three identical ones. You, you so, need another arm. 
And, well, no, it's going to be for, for, so my daughter, Christine, Christy William, Williamson, she's runs Building Science Fight Club, and she's a full professor of architecture. And uh, she says, what should I do, Dad? I says, well, they're identical boys. When they pop, you have to you know, tattoo them right away to tell them apart. And she hung up on them. <laughs> 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 and, Okay, she did that just for a joke. And, and I, I said, you know, moms always know the difference between even identicals. They just, moms know this. Dads don't always, but moms got it dialed in. That's just because you're a mom. I, I, I know many. Mom, mom might not call you the right name when she's yelling at you. She knows which one she means. It might not be the right name, though. <laughs> that doesn't matter if you're identical, though. You can look nothing like your sibling. You could be not even the same. Uh, and your mom's calling. If when she calls you the dog's name, you know you really. That's, like, it's when it's when you're doing good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right, I, I've got a, a a selfish question to ask here. I'm going to sneak one in. Uh, how often we should we be worried about running things like woofy models and doing hydrothermal analysis of assemblies? All right, you're going to hate me for this, but here it goes. Maybe you, you're assuming what I believe. So, yeah, all right. Sure. If you need to run a woofy model to figure out whether your wall or building works, you've got the wrong goddamn design. Okay. Are you kidding me? And, and, and by the way, most people, woofy is a lousy modeling tool, it, it, it can't handle complex three dimensional airflow networks, right? Can't do it. So you have to you have to put in fudge factors, and 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 you have to tune the model. Let me explain what tuning the model means. You have to fool the model into giving you the right goddamn answer. Right? Now, it's one of the best models we have, even though it's completely flawed, which tells which should tell you what the issue with modeling is. You do things according to first principles and historical experience, and you physically test things and you push them to failure. That's how you do stuff. And um, it just drives me, it drives me crazy. I, I had a lot of fun. I, again, I'm, maybe I'm ranting. I am ranting, but that's okay. That's uh, the point. That's okay. <laughs> there's a, I, I arranged for a big time consulting firm to get a contract to apply ASHRAE standard 160, which was sort of the performance limit uh, and, and, and WUFI, and had them run basically the WUFI calculations with the ASHRAE standard 160 limit on a dozen walls in five different climate locations, and they all failed. And what was neat was that all of those walls had had 30 or 40 years of successful experience. So, gee, you have a model that is run according to the best way you should be running it according to standard 160 and it shows that everything fails well which is more correct the real world or your model luke turn off the model go with your judgment luke turn off the guidance system go with the force the force is your judgment it should never it should never basically replace historical experience and good judgment. And this drives me crazy. Um, now, having said all of that, freaking clients want a damn model. They want the damn model. So what do we do? Well, we create an assembly that we know freaking works. And then we run the model on it and, and, and we call it a tune model. We push the model to make sure it gets the right answer. Now we get to charge five grand because that's what it costs to get new tires for my Porsche. I view it as a tax on stupid people. Yeah, I don't get invited to those conferences anymore either. Oh, yes, you do. Stop lying. No, I... You, you, you offended somebody the last time. And I'm like, huh, what? I, I don't even know anymore, you know, and I, I, I think I got into trouble when I said the second law doesn't care what pr what pronoun you use. That cut me off. There we go. 
Look, um, first principles, historical experience, build something, push it to failure, know the failure limit, then step back and give you a safety factor. That's the way it needs to be done. That's the way it was done or has been done in the past. And that's, we're relearning it. And I view that as a good way. So we end up having to do stupid stuff before we realize, oh, that's stupid. And we step back and, we never, and, then, we, and then we're doing smart stuff again. I'm, the pendulum has swung way out, but it's coming back. And, and I'm, I'm thrilled to watch it. I hate to run. I have to teach uh, a continuing education class tonight. Uh, happy holidays to you and Betsy. Uh, tell her I said hello. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's always a pleasure. And now I'm going to leave so you can say whatever you want about me, but it's recorded. So. Let, me, let, me, let, me, let me explain. I think the world of you, okay? So just you know, uh, try to stay out of trouble, okay? Uh, I, I'll get in a little trouble. But... <laughs> little bit so it was great to see you um and thank you so so much for joining us so this is the best way to kind of end bs and beer for 2023 so Definitely. thank you i am like don't don't hit the wrong buttons yeah leave it or actually i just realized hopefully one of us has controls to turn the show off in the end usually emily is the is the is the host the <laughs> well, we'll see we'll figure it out um yeah so there's much more questions there's questions that i have i'm sure ben has has, has some what's a what's a good good uh probably next to last see. question oh let's see where did it go uh jennifer martin would love to hear your thoughts on vapor open assemblies using natural building material assemblies things like straw with clay and lime finishes or hempcrete and lime plaster finishes how do you uh, feel about those types of assemblies? Well, no, I, I don't have an issue with them. They, uh, uh, I, you don't want them completely vapor open. You want to slow things down. So you, you want a vapor throttle. So you want to slow them down, but not stop them. And there's, I, <laughs> if this gets out, I used to do straw bale. Oh my God, you know, the. <laughs> production builders find out that Stebrick used to do straw bale. Oh my God, this is, you know, end of the world. But no, uh, all of those things uh, actually do work. Well, can, I, can I, can I uh, uh, sidearm you here real quick? What sure. would be Joe Stebrick's straw bale assembly in a cold climate? Well, it's not complicated. Uh, Texas metric straw, that's a, everything in Texas is measured in shitloads. So. Lots of, lots of straw and basically the continuous uh, playish stucco on the inside and the outside. And the key is that you wrap the window openings. So this is the punched openings, what we call it raccooning. In other words, you know, the big problem is water. It's a mass assembly and you don't want any water entering. So you wrap the inner membrane and the outer membrane together at the punched opening and then you paint or line paint the opening with acrylic latex paint to reduce its water absorption. So you basically have created a, a flashing system that the window was, is gonna, when the window ages and leaks, it drains to the outside. You do the same thing at the top of the wall, you, you know, whatever. And then you put your wood structure, which is, I'm sure it's gonna be wood, it's not gonna be concrete or steel or, or spray foam. <laughs> I'm killing myself here on, <laughs> on, 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 on the top of it. Uh, the biggest risk is where it touches the ground. And so what you want is you want uh, to have a, a bunch of rocks or boulders that are basically the, the capillary freight. And then you coat the bottom of, of it and tie it in. So you're basically covering all of the surfaces of your core. And then, um, that's going to be able to dry in both directions in a slow way, and that'll work. Just... All right, well, go for it, Mike. Or just coincidentally, next week in Portland, Maine, uh, or the discussion group there is going to talk about concrete-free slabs. 
Um, I've heard Steve Bezek say you invented concrete free slabs back in the 80s or something. So what's or, or but I haven't seen any details. What's or what's your take on a concrete concrete free slab? Is it a terrible idea? What's the right way to do it? What's the wrong way to do it? All right. I I did a bunch of buildings in 79, 80, 81, 82 that were, you know, uh, they're on our website, okay. And I, I, I you know, um, where we talked about you know wood slab on grade and wood foundations and literally no concrete at all. And yeah, and and so what did I learn? I learned how not to. <clears throat> I learned how not to do it, but that taught me how to do it. And uh, we wrote it up. I, it's on our website. If you want to, mm-hmm. it's called you know Picasso does assemblies. See, Pablo Pagasso had his blue period, and I had my wood period. <laughs> so, you know, my anti-concrete period, and and so we know how to do that. And the question is, is are we willing to to do it, and and, and with the limitations that we uh, with limitations that we, we we have, and so, you know, um, I. It was kind of wild. I, I, I put down a granular pad, stones, eight inches, and then laid everything out with, you know, two expanded poly, expanded polystyrene, which people now hate. And then I put my wood foundation on the top of that floating, basically floating wood assembly, and then, you know, built everything above it. And so it, and the frost protection is the horizontal insulation, you know, shallow frost protected and it worked fine. Um, the, the problem with that approach right now is that people hate the expanded polystyrene. And so the idea is, um, I'm, could we have this work with the rigid wood fiber board? And the answer is yes, but not with the one that they currently have. And so these, they, they need to, like they're, they're having enough trouble. They're, their hands are full already, just getting going with what they're currently, whatever these, more special these products will be developed. I'm, I'm sure they are, and that'll give us the ability to, to to do virtually everything if you wanted to. Nice. And in that case, what's worse, uh, the ex- extreme polystyrene or the concrete? So we need to remember to you know weigh things against one another if we're gonna you know make broad. Well, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna say that I, I think we don't need. I think we can. Do, we'll be able to do it without the polystyrene. All right, but not yet. All right. Was your anti-concrete period was that immediately after you had all the floating tubes in the slab that time? Yeah. <laughs> okay. We could do an entire show of Joe's stupid stuff. <laughs> and uh there was some colossally insanely stupid stuff and and uh one day uh, I'm gonna have I can I'll lose totally all total credibility. Like you actually did that. Why are we even listening to you? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well probably time to begin wrapping things up, Ben. I think we're about there though. We could keep doing this for a while, or at least of I course, could. Yeah. Um Joe, thank you, sir. Your work has been an inspiration to my career, and it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you and share some time with you. Um, thank you. Well, it's a again, it's an honor and a pleasure, and and uh, love to love to hang with you, hang with you one day, without having to do the Zoom thing. We could maybe do it in person and not wear a mask and and tell stories. And uh, I'm still not going to be drinking beer. I'm going to be drinking wine, but uh, I, I've I won't be offended if you drink beer. I, if you're, 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 I'll be, you're, you're my inspiration to drink beer. I, I, I just can't, can't drink it anymore for other reasons. But anyway, but I just don't know which wine to order. That's the only reason I drink beer. <laughs> this is easy. Red wine with a cork. That's it. That's, that's it. That's the first step. Red wine with a cork. All right? Screw top. No. Red wine with a cork. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Joe. Really appreciate your time and and all you do for the industry and inspiration in my you. career as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, take care, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll catch you all on the flip side and uh, 
Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs>